Uh, my name is Art Bishop. I'm very, very proud to be a member of the Apple Valley Town Council. I sit right there where my name plate is. Uh, it is an honor to have you here today. The reason I asked our code enforcement, uh, Animal Code Enforcement Division to, to do this today, and we're so fortunate to have the state here. I saw them, some, oh, there's the young man right there. Is that a lot of my constituents, a lot of the people just like you that live in Apple Valley have been calling me and saying, oh my God, oh my God, Art, there's a coyote in my backyard. Can you call animal control and have them come on over and take care of it? I go, well, you know, what is it you expect us to do? Well, you shoot it. I go, well, that's probably not going to happen. <laughs> oh my God, oh my God, Art, there's a rattlesnake in my backyard. What do you want me to do? Well, that's probably not going to happen. And we have, you know, I've lived here a long, long time, and I see we have some first timers here too. <laughs> And we, we are so fortunate to live in such a beautiful community where we combine our beautiful town of Apple Valley with our native desert. And there are a lot of animals that are native to our area. Um, my house the other night, unfortunately, or fortunately either way, had three raccoons on the roof, scaring the dickens out of my poor wife. I uh, had a skunk in my backyard not too long ago the skunk and my dog didn't do well together, to be quite honest with you. Um, there's also, I have a covey in my backyard of about 25 to 26 quail, which are absolutely beautiful, but I also have a red-tailed hawk that lives up in one of my cypress trees. So you have to balance, the, you know, the way the whole thing turns out. I think the most important thing here for us today is that we need to learn to be able to live with these wonderful animals that we're so lucky to have in our community and not be automatically calling 911 or your animal shelter and saying, you know, you need to come take this animal because there's not a lot that you're going, you're going to learn a little bit later here. There's not a lot that we can do when it comes to wild animals other than appreciate them. They were here a long time before we were here. But one of the most interesting things I think that we're going to find out today is how you're going to deal with an animal, if you're out walking, I recently, my, my neighbor had a mountain lion in his backyard and it scared my poor neighbor who's a dentist just to death. And he said it scared him more than anything when it jumped into my backyard. So um, he was just, he was been very nervous for the last six months. So we're going to find out a lot about how we deal, how do we live, how do we share Apple Valley, our home, with the animals that have been here so long. So please, as this continues, and you're gonna have the opportunity to ask questions. Ask whatever's on your mind, because that's the whole idea today, is be able to share the information with these experts from the town and the state and how we're gonna deal with them. So on behalf of your town council, I wanna thank you so much for coming here tonight, and I hope you enjoy yourself. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Joshua Hall, I'm an animal control officer here for the town of Apple Valley, and I have some of my other co-workers here with me today. That Officer Solomon, and also I have, uh, as previously stated, a representative from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, uh, he's here, as also, he's a biologist named uh, Kevin, and he will also be here to answer any questions you may have that may not be on the slides. <coughs> today we're gonna t cover topics, kind of our big four, I call them our big four, coming up into the spring season. These are the ones that we get the most calls on. So we're going to go over some quick facts, little facts and tidbits about each individual animal, as well as uh, some tips for coexistence, things that we can do to prevent uh, further problems with these guys. So without further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started. And then uh, up here in the front, we do have flyers for different types of animals. So at the end of the event, you're more than welcome to come up here and grab a flyer, OK? <clears throat> All right, so as previously stated, we're gonna cover four topics today. That's gonna to be the coyote, the bobcat, raccoon, and snakes. Snakes will be uh, a few different species of snakes, all wrapped up into that, that one um, title. Number one, coyote. The desert's most successful opportunist is the coyote. Its skill as a hunter for anything that can be swallowed ensures the omniv omnivore's survival. The coyote's diet may include insects, lizards, snakes, birds, rodents, rabbits, carrion, fruit, nuts, grass, or tortoises. 
along with anything else that can be chewed or torn. Coyotes are famous for their howling, but also bark when excited. And they hold their tails between their legs while running and can reach speeds of up to 40 miles an hour. Some coyote facts, um, some distribution, abundance, and the seasonality of coyotes. Coyotes are common to abundant and a permanent resident throughout the state. They live in almost all habitats and can be seen in elevations as high as over 9,000 feet, all the way down to large cities such as Los Angeles. They are known to frequent open desert, open brush, scrublands, and all other habitats in between. Their habitat and breeding, coyotes like areas of brushy strands of vegetation, natural cavities, uh, and suitable soil for excavation of dens to, prov and to provide cover. They will use natural rock cavities, hollow trees and logs, caves and holes. Coyotes will dig dens usually on a brushy covered south facing slope and they will also only make dens and stay in them when they're raising pups. Coyotes need a reliable water source and will frequent um, areas that have standing water year round. Uh, in California, uh, mating season is from January to March and the gestation is about 63 days. Most young are born March through May and coyotes average a litter of five to six pups once a year. Uh, coyotes mate for life and will stay in a home range with that mate. The coyotes diet, um, as previously stated on the last slide, coyotes are an omnivorous, omnivorous, omnivorous opportunist. They eat primarily mice, rats, ground squirrels, gophers, rabbits, and carrion. They're also known to eat insects, reptiles, amphibians, fruits, and occasionally birds and their eggs. Locally, some coyotes may take sheep, goats, domestic fowl, and even small dogs and cats. Coyotes are known to stalk and chase and may dig out their prey when located. They hunt either solo, in pairs, or in small packs known as family groups. They favor open habitats where they can locate and chase down their prey. Their activity patterns, they are active year long, year long mostly nocturnal, occasionally diurnal, but mostly active in the early evening throughout the night. Coyotes are non-migratory and their movements vary with the seasons. They often follow roads, trails, fence lines, and pre-made paths to get from place to place. Relocation, this is a question we get a lot about coyotes and relocation. There is no trapping and relocating of coyotes. Um, using traps to contain a healthy coyote is very difficult and in most cases can't be done. Legal means of trapping are regulated by the Department of Fish and Wildlife. However, those means of trapping result in a fatal outcome for the coyote and in some cases can trap unwanted target species like foxes and domestic dogs and cats. This here is a breakdown of coyote's appearance. Um, coyote in comparison to pets and a fox. So the coyote is labeled here um, or is colored as the dark gray color. You can see it's a, got a bushy distinctive black tip on the end of the tail. And the Labrador Retriever, your common Labrador Retriever, on average is about twice the weight of a coyote. So they're, your average, you know, lab or, or large species dog is, is about twice the size of a coyote. So the average fox is much smaller than a coyote, which is down here, guys. Um, foxes are smaller than coyotes, but larger than cats. And domestic cats can and sometimes appear as prey. So this is just a little breakdown of like size comparison. Coyotes aren't as big as, you know, wolves or anything like that. They're a fairly medium sized um, size animal. Some tips and tools for coexistence. Urban and rural residential landscapes offer an abundance of food and water and shelter for coyotes. Take the following steps to prevent coyotes from being attracted to your home. So here are some, uh, some tips and tools here. These are very important. If you, don't, if you have coyotes frequenting your area, we would suggest you kind of take these tips and, and you know, go with them. Uh, wildlife proof your garbage in sturdy containers with tight fitting lids. Don't leave pet food outside. Coyotes will come and eat pet food if left unattended. Take out trash in the morning and pick up as scheduled. When pickup is scheduled. Keep compost in secure containers. Keep fallen fruit off the ground. Coyotes will eat fruit. Keep bird seed off the ground. Seeds attract rodents, which then attract coyotes. Remove feeders if coyotes are seen in your yard. So remember to pick up after the bird seed. Don't leave it around because it, it's a, it starts a cycle. If you don't pick up the bird seed, bird seed attracts rodents. Rodents then attract predators. 
Eliminate accessible water sources in your yard. Like previously stated, coyotes need a, a standing water source year round, so make sure you don't have anything that would want them to come and take advantage of that. Clear away brush and dense weed near buildings. Close off crawl spaces under decks and around buildings where coyotes may den. If you frequently see a coyote in your yard, make loud noises with pots and pans or air horns and haze the coyote. So hazing is important. Um, hazing, some people may think it's cruel or inhumane, yelling, screaming, banging pots and pans, using air horns, spraying water at a coyote. It may look like you're being inhumane or cruel, which that may be if you were doing that to a domestic animal, like somebody's dog or cat. But that is the best thing you can do for a coyote, is haze the coyote. Make that coyote fearful of you. Um, if a coyote is afraid of humans, it is the best thing for that coyote. That coyote will then not want to come around people and will stay away, and that's what's best for the coyote. If the coyote starts to hang around, it becomes domesticated towards people because we're feeding it and we like it. That's not good for that coyote. It's not going to be a good outcome. That coyote become accustomed to being around people, and unfortunately, there's not a good outcome for that coyote in most cases. So haze them. I know it seems silly. People scare the coyote. You want him afraid of you. Um, and then make sure you share this list with your neighbors. Um, coexistence is a neighborhood effort. Make sure that we're everybody in your, if you have a problem with a coyote in the neighborhood, make sure that everybody in your neighborhood's following these, these tips. Uh, if you have everybody's doing it, but you have one person who likes that coyote and feeds it and puts out water for it, the whole neighborhood may not want the coyote and, and that one person could be the problem for that coyote coming to that neighborhood every day. And he's not just gonna go to that house only. It's gonna keep coming to that house for those things, but it's gonna get into other people's properties as well. So share this with the neighbors. This is a, this is a neighborhood thing. We should all make sure we're keeping our um, food inside, making sure that we clean up our yards. We don't have places that would make suitable areas for them to hide in den and haze them and make sure they're afraid of you, okay? Um, just that's very important. That's the best way to deal with coyotes. Um, if those steps, as it says over here on the right hand side, this is when to contact animal services. If a coyote is injured or sick, if a coyote is severely injured or sick, you can contact us to come out and assess that and we will go from there. If the animal is severely injured and can be picked up, maybe sent to rehab or something of that nature, we'll look into that. Or if it's severely injured and needs to be humanely put down, those are options. If the resident has tried the tips listed above and the coyote is not fearful of humans. If the whole neighborhood is doing all the steps that are listed up here and we're hazing that coyote and that coyote is still approaching people and hanging out and not running away, those are things we'd want to be notified on. We would come out, we would assess that and go from there. Um, that's where we would make up a game plan of is it really not affected by hazing and is it being a problem to this neighborhood and we would begin our steps on how to, to fix that problem. If the coyote has become aggressive towards humans or private animals and is not affected by hazing, once again, previously stated, if you have a coyote in your neighborhood who's actively aggressive, that's a, that's a call to 911 or something of that nature. Okay? If, you have, if he's actively charging people aggressively, call 911, get the sheriff's department, us, we'll start rolling that way and we'll, we'll assess it. Um, or if you have one that's coming and pre preying on your animals every night, and you're doing all these steps and it keeps coming and coming and coming, um, document it, contact us, and we'll, we'll look at that. Animal services necessarily won't come out for a coyote just in the neighborhood. There's not much we can do. Coyotes, they live here, they're native here. As you saw pre on the previous slide, they can run up to 40 miles an hour, can jump six foot fences without touching it. There's nothing we're gonna be able to do to catch that coyote to remove it. The only thing we can do is if you're not comfortable with doing it, we're gonna come out there and haze that coyote away. That's all we're going to be able to do. Um, if that coyote does become a problem and has become a nuisance, we would then begin our steps with contacting either the Department of Fish and Wildlife to let them know what's going on and or a licensed um, state trapper. And they could come out and possibly do something with that. But animal services will not just come out to your neighborhood, unfortunately, and just pick up a coyote. And as stated, it's not as simple as just putting a dog trap out and trapping the coyote and relocating it. There's laws in place and it's very difficult to just trap a coyote and remove a healthy coyote. Okay, so the next step we're gonna go to here, we're gonna go in the next slide is bobcats. We're gonna go over some bobcats and some facts. And I think I'm gonna have Officer Solomon step in and he's gonna go through this one with you guys, okay? That one there, we'll go to the next slide when we're done. 
Perfect. All right, good evening. As he stated, I'm Officer Solomon with the Town of Apple Valley Animal Control, and I'll be speaking to you guys about bobcats. So I know sometimes I've gotten calls about uh, distinguishing bobcats from regular house cats. Sometimes it can be a little difficult, so hopefully this will be able to help you guys out, give you some more information and knowledge. Now, bobcats are entirely carnivorous and like to play on small mammals such as rabbits, mice, moles, and squirrels. Sometimes the birds and reptiles are included in their diet. The largest animals bobcats are known to kill are deer, uh, usually in the winter months when small rodents are scarce. And bobcats only hunt from dusk to dawn, so usually around nighttime, maybe early, early morning. Uh, bobcats favor uh, remote rocky outcrops and heavily wooded areas. Uh, though they are at times found on the urban edge, right outside on the outskirts of uh, town, that's where we get a lot of our calls and a lot of our interactions. Um, rugged terrain, deep forests and caves make perfect dens and hunting grounds. The home ranges established by bobcats are vast and guarded. Bobcats are very territorial and will outline their space by scent markings. While male territories sometimes overlap, females will not share their space with any other female bobcat. So you may see a couple males roaming around. If you're seeing multiple, maybe males. If it's just one singular bobcat, it's probably gonna be a female. And so the average bobcat, it's about 18 to 24 inches tall, uh, weighs anywhere from 15 to 30 pounds. Males are gonna be at that higher end of the weight scale. Uh, coloration, as you can see in the picture, it's gonna be tan with dark spots and a uh, lighter coloring, maybe white on the, uh, on the belly and under the chin. Uh, bobcats, so this is a big point, can be distinguished from regular house cats, big cats, uh, by their short bob tail, uh, usually about four to seven inches uh, with a black tip on the end. Uh, and they're gonna have tufts of hair on the tops of their ears and their cheeks. On the previous slide, you can see on the bottom of his jaw, he's got some hair coming down. That's usually gonna, how you're gonna tell it's a bobcat. Looks like little icicles coming down. Uh, bobcats uh, emit an eerie scream that can be heard from miles. So a bobcat doesn't necessarily need to be near you for you to be able to hear it. Bobcats' personal territories can span about 30 miles for males and about five square miles for females. These territories are clearly marked by the bobcat's urine and or feces. Uh, bobcats have excellent vision and hearing as well as well-developed sense of smell. Uh, unlike domesticated cats, bobcats enjoy water and are very good swimmers. Uh, a lot of our calls come from houses that are about the edge of town, near kind of this open desert, and a lot of them have pools in their backyards. If they don't, their neighbors have pools. Uh, bobcats are quiet hunters uh, and will pounce on their prey and kill it with one bite. Uh, these large cats are known to leap up to 10 feet in the air, even bigger than uh, coyotes. They can jump. They're incredibly skilled climbers. Bobcats can e easily maneuver around rocky terrain and climb up trees uh, when pursuing their prey. And bobcat tracks are easy to distinguish. So if you don't know if it's a coyote, you don't know if it's a bobcat, you can look for a roundish paw, about four toes, and there will be no claw markings. Usually with a dog, you'll see claws right above the toes. With a bobcat, they're gonna be completely round. And so I believe I'm gonna pass the microphone to Officer Hall, and he's gonna to speak to you guys about raccoons. Thank you. Okay, so real quick on Bobcat, just a couple things to remember. Um, as previously stated, they are very good climbers. This brings up a topic we get a lot of times with um, coyotes on top of telephone poles, or coyotes, bobcats on top of telephone poles. Uh, if a bobcat is on top of a telephone pole, it will come down. It can come down, and it will come down. Um, we, there's nothing we can do for that, okay? They climbed up there for a reason, probably because they were chased by something. And the best thing to do in that situation is put away your dogs, put away, let your neighbors know to put away their dogs, and to not stand at the bottom of the pole and watch it. Um, those bobcats are up there because they're afraid to come down. There was something that put them up there. And once they feel safe, usually at night, when nothing's around, they will back down that pole and disappear. Um, if you go up there and try to get it, you're going to panic it. It has nowhere else to go. It can't go any higher, and you're putting that bobcat in danger. Um, so just if you ever see one on a telephone pole, it's not a, uh, unless it's wrapped up in the telephone line or the power line, it will come down. Okay? 
So pass that along, they will back down. Just leave them alone, put all the dogs in the house. Um, and with the roundish claws, with the no claw markings, that's because bobcats, when they walk, they have retractable claws. So their claws are not actually out all the time, you know, like canine toenails are. So when they walk, they're silent. There's no toenails, it's all retracted. All right, number three, we're gonna move on to raccoons. Uh, raccoons are kind of one of our big topic points coming up here um, in the springtime. They are um, cute and fun, but also mischievous and can get themselves in situations um, quite a bit. Some raccoon facts. Raccoons are known as omnivores, meaning they eat both plants and animals. Some of their favorite foods include fruit, such as apples and berries, as well as frogs, rodents, and insects. A baby raccoon is called a kit or cub. Offspring are typically born in the early summer and will remain in the den until about 12 weeks before heading out to explore on their own. Raccoons will make their dens in hollow trees and, and in the ground. Both the raccoon's front and rear paws resemble a human hand, featuring five slender finger-like toes that enable them to easily manipulate, manipulate food and objects. So as you see here, they've got like little human hands, okay? And they can grasp, they can grow, they can pick up things. They're, they're real curious. Raccoons have extremely sensitive front paws with specialized hairs, allowing them to easily locate and identify objects by touching them. The sensitivity is increased when their paws are wet. This is why they frequent koi ponds, and they tend to be quite the nuisances around people's fish ponds and things. Very, very, very um, interested animal, and they're, they're very sensitive paw, and, the, and they love to use their hands to actually reach in and grasp things. Some tips for dealing with uh, raccoons. Never feed raccoons. Once again, never feed wildlife in general, okay? Never feed it, it's never the good outcome. As much as they look sad, they look cold, they don't need blankets, they don't need food, they don't need water. They are wild animals and they know how to live. Um, feeding them only will harm them further. Um, not only in just the diet, but their outcome if they become domesticated to people. So do not feed. So deliberate feeding of raccoons makes them more comfortable around humans and more likely to get into situations where they are unwanted or in danger. If there's no food or shelter to support them, most wild animals will go away and thrive in their natural habitat. Okay, so can't emphasize that enough. Coyotes, foxes, raccoons, possums, skunks, all of them. Do not feed them, okay? If you want them to be happy and healthy, do these tips to make them um, stay wild, okay? Fasten garbage can lids. Raccoons are notorious for getting in your garbage. They've got those silly hands and they can open, so make sure you fasten your garbage can lids. Keep sheds and garage doors closed so they cannot access them. Cut back tree limbs approximately three feet um, from roof lines. They love to be up in an elevated position. They will climb up, and if they can access, they will get into your roof and potentially try to set up shop up there. Harvest all ripe fruit from trees, shrubs, and off the ground. Remove brush piles and trash accumulation from your yard. Okay. Pick up family pet food and water dishes. Do not leave anything out overnight. Um, and sprinkle your lawn and garden beds with cayenne pepper. If you have something coming around messing with your garden, sprinkle a little cayenne pepper in there sometimes that will deter them um, from going in there. It's a little irritant. You can place ammonia soaked rags around the yard and under the house if you know where they're coming and going from. Another deterrent. Play a radio. Something that it's always changing. Okay, so a radio is always going to be a different voice, a different song, a different tempo, um, noise. So they can't learn the pattern. Um, if they learn a pattern, they'll get comfortable with it. So something that's always revolving, always changing, keeps them on their toes. Close off openings where roof lines overlap. Replace and reinforce damaged screen vents. Keep crawl spaces tightly covered and keep spark arresters on the chimney. As you can see, a lot of these are, are, are dealing with securing your home up, okay? Making all the areas where these animals want to be comfortable and warm um, blocking all of that off, preventing them from even getting in there to begin with, keeping them moving. I have a question. What yes. about pet doors? Like pet doors is another one, yeah. Close them. Just having any any pet door mm -hmm. just for the availability of predation on your pet from free roaming coyotes or bobcats yeah. in general? Mm -hmm. just yeah. Easy access to, yeah. to your unsecured pet? Yeah, so pet doors is a big one. Yeah, pet doors, if you do have one, you know, for your dog in, in and out during the day or whatever in your home, cool. Do not leave it open all night, okay? 
they're, they're going to learn. They'll follow your animal and they could come in the house and it's not a good thing. So yeah, dog doors, make sure if you have them, they're closed at night, especially, but um, yeah, anything that can, they can have access to getting a warmth. They're going to smell the food. They're going to smell the, the habitat. And if you give them the chance, they're going to find, trust me, if, if they're plenty happy living in a big old empty log in the, in the wild, but if they had the choice between an empty log or your big old cushy attic with all that insulation, because you don't want to fix that hole up on the roof, they're going to choose that. And then what happens is then it becomes a problem to get them out. Now we have a problem with a trapped raccoon. What do we do with it? And it just starts this escalation of situations that could have been prevented just by going up, putting some nails in a screen over that hole. Um, so the biggest thing is kind of like the coyotes, hazing, but with these guys, if you eliminate what they're coming to your yard for, they will go away. So if they're coming for food because you're not picking up your fruit, remove it, they'll go away. If they're coming for the water you have laying around, pick it up, they'll go away. Yes? What if you have livestock? Livestock? Like um, livestock, yeah, just wanna make sure your area is clean. You know, cleaning up, um, whatever your livestock doesn't, livestock doesn't eat that day, pick it up and remove it. Don't just leave it out all night. Because um, it's gonna, when they stop eating, they go to bed, one thing you'll notice on most of these slides is all these critters that we have up here in the desert that we're going over, they're mostly nocturnal. So they're going to be out in the late evening and at night. So if, if your livestock's not eating, the critters start to move in. If you're not picking up that extra hay or oats or grain that you're putting out or whatever, what does that do? Does a, does a raccoon necessarily want to eat potbelly pig food? Uh, he might, but not necessarily. Um, does a coyote want potbelly pig food? No. But if you leave it out there, it attract mice. Rats, because they'll eat it, but what follows those guys? Your predators. So yeah, picking that up, um, chicken coops. I suggest if you have chicken coops up here in the desert or really anywhere, making sure they're inside of an actual chicken coop, not a free range chicken. Okay, free range chickens can get themselves in danger. And it, um, but having a chicken coop and a chicken coop where at night you lock them up. Okay, you have like a chicken house or a, a, a hen house as they call them. And at night, they go in, you shut the door, lock it, pick up the food and water they had outside, and that's your routine for the night. That would be the best way to be the safest for your, for your actual chickens and also to prevent these guys from coming around. Okay? So, yeah. Next, this is kind of the big one that we run into, is the trapping and the legal status for raccoons. In raccoons, um, in California, raccoons are classified as fur bearers. The fur harvest season is set by the California Fish... California Department of Fish and Wildlife, which further determines when and how a raccoon may be taken. Raccoons causing damage may be taken at any time by legal means. The California Department of Fish and Wildlife regul regulations prohibit the relocation of raccoons and other wildlife without permission of the department. Uh, for further information, contact your Department of Fish and Wildlife. So here you got Title 14, California Department of Fish and Game, CCR Code 465.51 which is immediate dispatch or release. All fur bearing non-game mammals that are legal to trap must be immediately killed or released unless released trapped animals shall be killed by shooting where local ordinances allow and land orders to safety permit. And immediately released is defined as released at the same location where trapped. So this is where we run into the problem of we trapped the raccoon, can we just take it over to um, the riverbed six miles away and let him go? No. It's not allowed by law. That animal has to be immediately released and immediately released on the property. We cannot drive them to another area and release them. There's many reasons why. Um, that's one, it's gonna be detrimental to that animal. If you take it from one habitat and drive it to another, doesn't know that habitat, it's not fair to that animal. It's probably not gonna survive. You're also taking it to another area where other animals have established home ranges. It's gonna get predated on. It's gonna get potentially bullied on and um, that's not fair either. It's also for um, disease control. You take an animal from one area of Apple Valley or anywhere in California and you take it from one spot and drive it to another and let it go, who knows what that raccoon had on it? Might have had some mite or flea or who knows? Um, and you drive it over to another area and let it go. You just transported that disease. Okay, so there's reasons why those are in place and you have to immediately release that animal. Now, some of the positives are if you trap an animal and it's in a cage and it feels fearful for its you know, life and you release it immediately, sometimes an animal will run back into nature where it was living and will not come back. 
It feels like I got a second lease on life and it runs away. Um, but that being said, those are really our only options. So that's why this slide's so important, as well as with all wildlife, the hazing and the pre-setup and the uh, making sure your house is secure and the food's picked up so we don't get to this. Because if we get to this, there's really not a good outcome. It's either we come out, we release the raccoon, and you're maybe not happy because we just let the animal go, and you're like, what if he comes back? Well, I'm going to give you some tips, and we're going to look around your yard and see why he came in the first place. Maybe fix it. But if he comes back and he keeps doing this, there's not a good outcome for that raccoon. Okay? There's, there's, there really is not. Animal services will come to a residence and assist with identifying an animal that is possibly causing damage to a home and will also assist a homeowner with immediate release of a trapped raccoon, possum, or skunk after confirming the animal's healthy. However, animal services will not relocate the animal to a new location for a property owner. If you are having a problem with a nuisance raccoon, we will direct the resident to a licensed trapper to legally trap and dispatch the animal. Animal services will respond to all reports of injured and sick wildlife, but animal services will not euthanize any healthy wildlife. That is not, we're not gonna come out and trap, if you trap healthy wildlife, we, we will not euthanize that animal. If you trap animals, you're technically under the California Fish and Game Code of trapping. You're supposed to follow their rules and guidelines. Um, we will come out, we will make sure that animal doesn't have any signs of disease or injuries or rabies or any of that, and we will immediately release it in that area. Uh, that is per the law. Okay? And if anybody has questions on that later, we can definitely go over that, but that is the law. Um, we can come out, we can assess, we can look, we can give you tips on why and how to fix it, fixing stuff, blocking off holes. That's, that we will do. If you get a, let's say you're trapping feral cats, and you accidentally catch a raccoon, when they're in a cage, they are ferocious. They sound like demons, okay? They're very loud, they're very angry. They're, and rac raccoons, people don't realize, are very large. They can get very big, um, you know, 20, 30 pounds or more. They're big animals. And if they're in there and they're sounding like that and you're not comfortable with releasing that animal, I understand that. Um, I've been doing this 16 years and it still sometimes gives me the, the heebie-jeebies of opening that door and saying, please run that way. Okay? So, but we will come out and we will let him out of the trap for you. Okay? But that's what we're going to do. We're not going to drive it to Victorville and let it go. That's, that's, not the, that's not what we're going to do and that's not the law. Okay? So... On to our last slide is snakes. So this is gonna cover some different snakes, kind of our most common that we have. The high desert has a lot of snakes. Okay, we're not gonna cover all of them. We'd be here for hours. We're gonna cover kind of the big ones that we get um, most often um, here in the spring, summertime, okay? First off, we're gonna cover is rattlesnakes. Okay, number one is the Mojave Green. The Mojave Green Rattlesnake, a lot of people think that's the only rattlesnake we have, but it's not. We have multitude of different rattlesnakes up here in our area. The Mojave Green Rattlesnake is a highly venomous pit viper species found in the deserts of the southwestern United States and central Mexico. It is perhaps best known for its potent neurotoxic slash hematoxic venom, which is considered one of the world's most potent rattlesnake venoms. You're going to hear that word, those words, neurotoxic and hemotoxic. What that is describing is the actual venom itself. Uh, each rattlesnake has a different type of venom, and they, they uh, interact with the body, and they, they kill their prey in different ways. Neurotoxic is a, a toxin that actually attacks the nervous system of the, the prey and will, um, actually breaks down the, the, the neurotransmitters and attacks it on a neurological level. Hemotoxic is, as it states, hemo. So hemoglobin, like blood, it actually affects blood, and it's like necrosis. It will coagulate blood so that... The Mojave Green actually has a combination or a cocktail, a little bit of both. So that's why they're so um, dangerous and, and spicy. Uh, there's also our most common um, down here in the valley and in the fl uh, flatlands. So it's important to keep an eye out for these guys, okay? We are lucky here in California that our most venomous snakes have rattles on the end that let us know where they are. If you lived in the south, or something of that nature, you've got pit vipers down there that have no rattles, and they look a lot like every other snake. Um, our snakes do rattle, so if you hear the rattle, back away and go where it came, go back where you came from. Um, Mojave Green's misconception a lot of times is that Mojave Greens are this bright green color. So if it's not bright, bright green, it's gotta be something else. They're actually not bright green, they're kind of this olive drab military green color 
That is their, their color. They're almost the color of like a creosote bush. If you see the creosote bushes, that's where they commonly like to be is in the shrubs and the bushes. That's, their, that's why they're called that color, Mojave green. They get that little like olive color. Our other most common rattlesnake is gonna be the speckled rattlesnake. Uh, most adult speckled rattlesnakes measure 24 to 38 inches in length. Some giants measuring over almost 36 inches have been found. This species varies in color, often matching the earth tones of the rocks and soil and habits. Some occur in beautiful shades of orange or pink. Black speckles from an, um, indistinct crossbars and dorsal blotches across the back. Some desert specimens are colored like decomposed granite with dark rings that encircle the tail. The snake packs a powerful hemotoxic venom. So like this one here does not have the uh, neurotoxic venom. It's a hemotoxic venom only. But what's dangerous about these little guys is they blend into rocks extremely well. Our decomposed granite and our rocks where we like to rock climb and play like out at Horseman Center and all those areas, these guys blend in really, really well. Um, so you want to be careful when climbing in rocks and putting your hands in nooks and crannies and all that. That's where these guys like to hang out. So they're very hard to see. Um, hopefully they give you the warning. Um, but always pay attention when you're out playing in, in the, the deserts and stuff. Whether it be the flatlands, scrublands, or up in the rocks. Um, they're there. Continued with rattlesnakes. There are more. There's the Southern Pacific rattlesnake. Okay, this Southern Pacific rattlesnake is sometimes also called the Western rattlesnake or black diamond rattlesnake due to its diamond patterns running down the length of the snake. The snake is often confused with the Western diamondback rattlesnake because of the diamond shaped markings that both species have in common. But the Southern Pacific is much more common than the true diamondback within Southern California. The snake has a hemotoxic venom to destable its prey. So like previously, this one only has hemotoxic venom. This is one of our largest rattlesnake species up here. They're larger than the Mojave Greens and the Speckles. They get fairly large. Um, and like I said, we really don't have a lot of actual true Western Diamondbacks in our area. They're more like Arizona, New Mexico, down into Mexico. We really don't have them out here. You might see them as you get closer to Nevada, I guess, out there in Mojave National Preserve, but I've never really dealt with an actual um, Western Diamondback, but we do deal with the Southern Pacifics. Southern Pacifics, you're gonna see them more towards the foothills so as you're getting up in the Marianas, going towards Big Bear, Silverwood, going up towards the mountains, the reason they're a dark color is because the fact that they're at higher elevations typically. So they, the darker color helps absorb heat. So if it's colder out, they can actually s s absorb that heat better, being cold-blooded. They have to thermoregulate their temperatures. So that's, they're usually a really dark color. Uh, Mojave Sidewinder is uh, another one that we see uh, every so often. Sidewinder rattlesnakes are the smallest local rattlesnake. They can grow up to nearly three feet in length, but are more around one to two feet. The snakes in our area are typically more pinkish than the rest of the Mojave. They have a dark stripe behind their eye, brown dorsal blotches. Sidewinders are named after their unique mode of locomotion. These snakes are venomous with a hemotoxic venom, but possess a weaker venom than many other rattlesnakes in our area. So just like the name says, Sidewinder, these are the snakes that you see that actually move sideways. They, they do not actually move forward like a normal snake. They move sideways. That's how they move. Um, and they got little horns above their, their eyes, and they're a smaller rattlesnake species. Once again, usually going to be somewhere near like sand, stuff of that nature, um, and they blend in really well with the dirt. Um, that's their, their defense. Um, here's our guy that catches a lot of flack for being a rattlesnake, but is not actually a rattlesnake. Okay, even though he wants to make himself look like one, kind of, he's not a rattlesnake. This guy's completely harmless and is in all aspects good to have around your house. Okay, if you have squirrel problems, mouse problems, things of that nature, I would pick one snake in my yard over 50 squirrels. So, snake's not going to do anything to you unless you touch it. So, these guys are, if you see them, you know, leave them alone. If you're not sure, call us. That's what we're here for. But this is called the gopher snake. It's a non-venomous, large and heavy body. The gopher snake is reported to reach uh, nine feet in length, but four feet is our most common. On its back are 33 to 68 light to dark brown or reddish blotches on, on a ground color of yellow, straw, tan, and cream. Smaller blotches are located on the animal's sides and a dark stripe runs from the front of the eye to the angle of the jaw. The underside is a creamy or yellow, often with dark spots and the scales on the back are strongly keeled, becoming smoother on the sides. Commonly mistaken for rattlesnakes due to the defense it uses by shaking the tip of its tail in debris to scare away threats, 
The gopher snake is also very vocal and will hiss very loudly and make itself seem intimidating. So gopher snakes have like, at the very end of their tail, they have like a really hard last little scale. It's like a little bead. And what they do is they stick that tail inside of whatever they're near, sticks, leaves, branches, and they can actually make that tail go really fast and make a, like a, a ticking sound. It is not the same as a rattlesnake. If you get up to a gopher snake and he's doing that, it's usually like intimidating, but it won't make the hair stand up on your back. A rattlesnake, you will know it's a rattlesnake. It's a very deep, deep sound. And it's a very, it, you will know. People ask me, how do I know? You will know. You will know the difference between a rattlesnake and a gopher snake rattling its tail. What these guys do really well too is they will puff up and make a really loud hissing sound. It's like a, like just a deep, deep, deep hiss. Um, very loud and it's intimidating and but all in all that's the only thing that it has to, to offend itself is to make itself sound like a rattlesnake kind of sort of look like a rattlesnake and be really loud so hope that you leave it alone um, they are non-venomous they do bite they are large they will cause damage they can hurt um, so i highly suggest them, do not pick them up just let them be um, but they are not venomous okay they they eat their prey by constriction so they will actually wrap around and, and constrict their prey. Um, but this is our biggest guy here that takes a lot of flack. See a lot of calls. And, it, and if you get a call for a snake in your yard um, and you call us, please wait till we get there. Don't dispatch the snake. Because then when I get there, I, don't, I would rather, you know, maybe move the snake out of your yard. But if it's a gopher snake, the countless times that I've been called to a, a rattlesnake call, and I try to get there as quick as I can, and I get there and I find a gopher snake in two pieces which could have been prevented. So if you're gonna call us, um, keep an eye on the snake at all times. Do not leave eye, size, um, eye contact with it because when I get there, I'm gonna to wanna to know where it is. If you have a snake in your yard and you call us and I'm, rolling, I'm coming that way and I get there and the snake was in your backyard by the pool but you're in your kitchen on top of the counter, I don't know where that snake is now. It's gonna be hard for me to find it. So staying a safe distance away and keeping an eye on it so that when I get there, I can identify the snake and remove it if need be um, is important. But we'll go over how to distinct, um, put the difference between the two later. But this guy here, take a good picture of him because um, he shouldn't take the rap for rattlesnakes. And rattlesnakes aren't bad either, okay? They have their purpose and we, we don't want to see them hurt either. Some other snakes, these are kind of our other ones that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, red racers or coach whips. This is the most viewed snake within the Mojave Desert. It can be seen on many roads, sunning itself in the early to late morning hours. It is the fastest snake in the desert, moving up to seven miles per hour and can reach up to six feet in length with a slender whip-like body. Coloration may vary from gray to tan, pink, with black crossbars, always present on the neck. Okay, the snake gets older. Um, it begins to take a more distinct reddish appearance. Its diet consists of lizards, small snakes, mice, and birds. It's very mean-tempered and should not be handled, although not poisonous. Its bite can tear the flesh and should be avoided. These are very spicy snakes, okay? Um, I, I refer to these as spicy noodles. Um, they're fast and they're, they're, they're little. I mean, they, they're little guys compared to gopher snakes. They're very angry. I've yet to meet a, I've ne yet to meet a red racer that was friendly. They're all spicy. Yeah, the, I mean, as soon as they're born, they're just mad. Um, but that being said, they're harmless and they're good to have around, okay? Um, these guys will go find like a, um, a mouse nest and will go in and eat every pinky out of that nest. And they can get into small areas where these rodents are, eat them, and move on. Um, they're not bad to have around, okay? Um, question. Yeah, what's up? You got a question? Can I eat it? Can you eat the snakes? The spicy yeah. noodle snake. Oh, the spicy noodle? Um, I would suggest going to your local grocery store. Um, they have spicy noodles there that would be less harmful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. These these guys are just very angry. They're just they'll just they just and they and when you if you pick them up, they'll bite you three four times before you even go. Did I just get bit? They're just fast. So. But that being said, if you see them, leave them alone. They're the same thing. They're no harm. Just let them be about their business. If they get in your house or your garage or something like that and you want them out, we'll come out, remove them for you. All right. 
Um, then we move on to the king snake. The California king snake is a non-venomous snake uh, endemic to the western United States and northern Mexico. Due to the ease of care and wide range of color variations, the California king snake is one of the most popular snakes in captivity. These snakes are usually um, dark brown or black in color with whitish yellow bands. The king in their name refers to the propensity to hunt and eat other snakes, including venomous rattlesnakes. They are commonly indigenous to their natural um, habitat. So they'll eat rattlesnakes. They are king snakes. They are immune to rattlesnake venom. So if they get bit by a rattlesnake, they, then nothing happens to them. Um, they're, in most cases, docile. And as previously stated, they're prettier. They're a pretty looking snake. So people want to take them from the wild and keep them as pets. My suggestion to that is if you want a snake, check with your parents. And we have great snakes at Petco and PetSmart, local feed stores. Okay, don't, don't pull them out of the wild and keep them as pets, okay? If you see these guys in the wild, take a picture and, and leave them be. Um, they, they are non-venomous, like previously stated, um, and they're good to have around, same thing. Common thing with all these non-venomous snakes, good to have around, all right? Um, you, you can have mice in your house or mice in your garage, and a snake's not gonna hurt you unless you, you go out of your way to mess with it. You could be in your garage sweeping and breathe in mouse, what we call mouse muffins or mouse droppings. Next thing you know, you've got hantavirus just from breathing in mouse muffin. These guys coming around your house are gonna take care of the mice, which then in turn helps keep your garage clean. And these guys stay to their business. They don't, they don't wanna mess with you. So if you leave them alone, they'll just move about and you know, handle the rodents in your neighborhood. Um, you'll see a large increase in populations of squirrels and stuff in neighborhoods. As you drive down roads, you see all these mounds of squirrels everywhere. It's because a lot of the predators are being taken away. Um, bobcats and coyotes are being shooed away. Snakes are being killed. You get rid of the predators, the prey and the rodents just tend to climb. They take over. So these guys are here to help us, okay? So when will we come out? If you have a snake in your yard, that you need to have removed or identify will come out for that. If it's a snake on 10 acres of property out in your back part of your backyard and it's not a rattlesnake and it's not causing a threat, we're not gonna respond for that. We're gonna tell you, just go ahead and go back in the house, you'll be safe and you'll be gone in the morning, I promise. Um, if a snake gets in your house or is inside of a dwelling, we will come out for that. Or if one's sick or injured, not a problem. Uh, if you see a snake in your yard and you're able to take a picture but you just wanna know what it was, no harm in calling, and we'll, maybe we'll swing by and we can look at that picture and let you know what it is just to, for ease of mind to let you know, hey, that's a gopher snake or that's a red racer. You're good to go, okay? Um, how to tell the difference. This is the difference between uh, the rattlesnakes and our other snakes. So this goes for gopher snakes and all the other species. Um, real simple way, uh, the, the rattlesnake has an ellipt ellipt elliptical pupil, so the pupil is vertical. Okay, uh, it's got pits on the front, which are heat sensing pits because they are a natural pit viper, which means they kind of see in like infrared. So they can actually see like heat signatures of their actual prey. Uh, they have an upturned nose and fangs. So this right here, these big cheeks that kind of stick out and up here, the big old cheeks that stick out, their mouth isn't filled with food. That's their pit viper. That's where the glands are, the venom glands. Um, your non-venomous species are going to have a rounded nose, no fangs or pits, nostrils, and the round pupils. They got round pupils instead of the vertical pupil. It's one way to tell the rattlesnake from the gopher snake. I wouldn't suggest getting down on the ground and getting really close to check their eyes. Okay, if you're not comfortable with that, just call us. Okay, but that is one way that you can tell. Okay, um, and remember, a rattlesnake can strike half its body length. So if you're, you know, our, our rattlesnake's four feet long, if you're eight, nine, 10 feet away, you're perfectly safe. It's not gonna chase you down and it can't strike and jump out and get you, okay? So just stay, stay away and call us, keep an eye on it. Uh, the way to tell the venomous, also here, we got demonstration, you got the head is triangular and much wider than the neck. Rattlesnake's got big venom glands, which come down to a much smaller neck and then back to a very wide body. They're very heavy bodied creatures. And then it'll come all the way down to the tail, where it then tapers off to the rattle. Okay, so if you can't see the tail, but you don't know if it's a rattlesnake, that's what you're looking for. If you can see the head part of it, you're looking for those big venom glands and where the head's bigger than the neck. If it's bigger than the neck, stop where you are. 
okay? Um, with the non-venomous species that we have up here, their head is narrow, slightly larger than the neck, but not much. It's gonna go from the head to the neck and there's not much of a change in, in size. It's just pretty, pretty cylindrical, pretty, pretty much the same all the way down. This guy goes big to small to very large again. These guys will go from head to pretty much the same size all the way down to where it starts to really taper off to a very tiny point. Okay, so instead of going down to a rattle, it's gonna come down to a very, very small pointy end of the tail. And that's how you can tell your biggest difference between non-venomous and, and venomous snake species. So if you see a snake that cylindrical, all pretty much the same size, all the way down and then down to a very fine, tiny, tiny point, probably gonna be a safe snake. Still, let it do its thing and move about its business. I wouldn't suggest messing with them because the only time you're gonna get bit by a snake is if you touch it. They will not chase you down. They're not gonna hunt you. They're only gonna bite you if you invade their space and pick them up, okay? Uh, at this point, um, does anybody have any questions? Go ahead, yep. Um, what if you see a lot of red racers? So you may be near a possible like den or where a hatch. So they may have just, you know, had a, a batch of them and they're moving out. They won't stick around. They're not, they're not um, pack animals. Snakes are not pack animals, they're solitary. So they'll move out and they'll spread about their way and go find their little habitats and move on. Snakes also don't usually pick a home range, so they're not gonna pick like your backyard and that's their house and they stay there forever. They, they, they move with the food. They're always searching. Um, why does the raccoon get to near trash? What happens if a raccoon gets in your trash? Then you're gonna wanna secure your trash better. So you're gonna try to figure out how he got in there, how they got that lid open or how they got that open, and then try to secure it even better. Um, to prevent him from doing that. You can also put out motion sensor lights, things of that nature near your trash can to try to scare him away from your trash can, letting him know that you know he's there. Okay? So, um, is there any other questions? Yeah. So, so this has been a, an extremely wet year for us, which is not normal. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's still raining today. Mm -hmm. Can we expect a larger population of uh, native animals because of all the rain and, and possible a lot more rodents and, yeah. and smaller. Uh, that's a fantastic question. And actually, if you're comfortable with that, uh, I would like to have Kevin. Uh, I mean, uh, on balance, you could positively, yeah, positively equate higher productivity, uh, more moisture, more spring green up, more food for, for native wildlife. Um, so quite possibly sure, um, slightly higher populations, but um, what I would say that would, would correlate to a higher, um, higher productivity and higher instance of human wildlife interactions and human wildlife conflict. Um, so we can definitely assume it's gonna be a very productive spring and a very productive summer um, with our native wildlife here, which, um, yeah, brings us back to securing the attractants, securing our trash, securing our, our livestock, securing our chicken coops, um, not, not giving um, you know, our native predators any cause um, to come into close quarters with, with humans and their, their property, um, namely pets as well. So yeah, so once again, um, I'd like to introduce, this is Kevin Howells. Yeah, Kevin Howells. Kevin Howells. He is a uh, human and wildlife conflict biologist for the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. So he's actually an excellent tool and came all the way up here tonight just for this to, to answer questions. So questions that I may not have, he will have for you, okay? So does anybody have any other questions in regards to any wildlife, laws in regards to trapping, any of that? No. Um, one thing that, that I deal with for those that don't know me, my name's Annie. Um, I have a local wildlife control business here. Um, and I, I deal with a lot of the issues that I'm, I'm hearing spoken about. And I also do everything that I can to help people mitigate wild human wildlife interaction problems. That said, a lot of people that are um, removing snakes, um, I've been told by Sacramento that it is illegal for them to take those snakes into their location. I don't 
don't do that when I remove space. Um, am I correct? Um, you mean to relocate? Yep. Yeah. yeah. So, so the state does not sanction any individual relocating wildlife into new habitat, putting snakes specifically uh, into different um, riparian areas, for example. Um, re relocating wildlife never, it never is the solution to wildlife conflict and wildlife problems. You're introducing wildlife um, into conflict with other native animals there or putting them into space where they can cause problems with different homeowners as well. Exactly. And it's so a very highly populated and state. And that's ex exactly the transmission of disease as well, cross species, interspecies as well is, is a huge concern. So yes, re relocation of wildlife um, from reptiles to mammals. Yep. Sorry, I do a lot of snake removal. Yep. You know, and if I can't, if some of these properties are 200 acres, awesome, same property. Yep. Yes, I can legally and you know release this according to the best file what we know today about about releasing snakes. But I, mean, I have people telling me all the time that you're wrong. I can do whatever I want. Da, 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 da. No, you can't. Yep. It's all there in the fishing game code. That's what I tell people. And they say, well, it doesn't say snakes. It says it says mammals or, or trapped wildlife. And so you get into these little. You know, Semantics. Yep. People, you know, they ask me to ask be educated. I try to educate them, and then, and then they, then they, then they want to argue with me. Sure. Basically. So, it's not so that. that's where, as a human wildlife conflict biologist, you can forward them to me for for these conversations. If I need to, I will. Yep. It, oh yeah, it happens. <laughs> Ground squirrel release is a big problem around here too. Oh, yep. That's huge. I catch people doing that. I'll call them, and I don't care. Yeah. And, and you don't need, as a homeowner with ground squirrels, I mean, I understand they can cause quite a nuisance to, to the property and to the landscape. Yep, and, and you don't need uh, a trapping license to, to trap yourself as a homeowner um, if you deem, you know, there is ways to mitigate that conflict uh, in a less than lethal manner, but you know, uh, uh, as the fish and game go code goes, you don't need um, a trapping license to, to remove them uh, lethally yourself. But again, I, I never advocate lethal removal of wildlife. <laughs> Well, yeah, that's, that's a, PC 597, right? You can't, you can't yep, that is an inhumane treatment of wildlife, right? Exactly. But yeah, there's a lot that goes into this. So. Definitely. <laughs> it's it crazy. I, I do a lot of camping, and I've been very fortunate camping a number of years here in the high desert. I've had the ability to see a lot of tortoises uh, in, the, um, in the wild. And there are a lot of people that still, when, and we don't have as many tortoises, unfortunately, as we used to, um, but they'll, they'll pick them up. And I just thought maybe you could take a second and talk about it. I know we're really talking more about coyotes and raccoons, but the, the tortoise is such a beautiful creature that's very specific to our area. Maybe I thought you could speak to it. Yeah, um, they are, I mean, sulcatas and the desert tortoise, the two main species here um, are both federally protected so any you know uh, harassment or molestation of the tortoise, if you see it in the wild, um, you know is is technically illegal. Um, you know they're at times they may be viewed as um, helpless just on their general uh, appearance and slow movement and disposition. But you know I always suggest folks they see a tortoise in the wild, safely observe it. You know it's it, they're they're beautiful. Take pictures. Yes, that's you know what uh, what Instagram is for in, in some parts. Um, but never pick them up. Um, we just had uh, uh, somebody come uh, report that they observed a tortoise over in the Palm Springs area and they thought it was injured. So they pick, uh, picked it up and, and brought it home. You know, th those types of things, um, you know, is a good educational opportunity for me to, to talk with that person and let them know that you're not sure if there is dependent young with that uh, or they're incubating uh, eggs or, or, you know, you have no idea what's going on with that tortoise. So, you never, under any circumstance, want want to pick them up. And again, they're federally protected. So any handling of them without any sort of uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife permit um, is uh, illegal. So, you know, to your point, they're beautiful and they are great to have here. I mean, not a lot of states get to have federally protected tortoises that are are native. Um, but enjoy them from from a distance, yeah, and and never never handle them or, or even bring them home for any any reason. But I mean, you, and you can, I mean, there is permitting processes, um, which I, I do help out with um, 
through the California Tortoise and Tortoise, uh, Tur Turtle and Tortoise Club, um, where you can adopt them um, and have them for, for decades, but taking one from the wild um, and, and trying to have them as a, a pet or anything like that without following the proper channels, yes, is uh, illegal and will most likely be um, very harmful for the animal itself. Thank you. Yeah, so first I would say always keep your dog leashed. Um, a lot of folks on hikes and whatnot like to let their pet roam with them because you're in an open space, um, but always keep them on a leash. And I never suggest uh, the extender leashes, usually a fixed rope of six feet or less. Um, that way, if an animal does come in, like a coyote or a lion, you're able to pull and get control of your animal. Because a lot of times, especially with, with coyotes, if they're approaching, you're, you're approaching you, usually there's a proxy between you, so you're, they're interested in your dog. If you're able to pick up your dog and hold your dog, that, okay. no, it, that usually is a, a great way to mitigate conflict. But it, in the event of having a larger dog, always you know, make yourself big, make your presence known, stretch your arms out. I suggest hiking with um, an air horn. You know, they're, they're relatively cheap under 20 bucks, um, they're small, you can carry, carry it with you while you hike. Um, and a couple blasts from the air horn, you know, usually is enough to condition that animal pretty quickly that this is a, you know, a possibly a dangerous scenario for me as the animal that's looking at the dog. Um, and then another thing is very important, never turn your back and run. A lot of folks see wild animals, even with seeing a lion and get very scared, understandably but you want to make yourself as big as possible, make yourself loud, your presence known, and slowly remove yourself from that area. And not, especially with a lion, not give it um, a reason for, for chase because you know, that instinctually is within them. When they see something running, they pursue as, you know, as, as predators, as carnivores. So see the animal, make sure it sees you and you don't sneak up on it. Yell, be loud, carry an air horn, um, even like a can of, uh, like a metal can with some rocks in it with a lid as a shaker. Um, that's another, uh, something else that a lot of folks uh, deploy uh, when they're walking their dogs. And um, yeah, it, 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 it does help. And, you know, if it's getting closer, feel, you know, grab, have a stick with you or something to physically defend yourself because they're not going to want to, most, most animals are not going to want to risk injury in a situation like that. They're smart. Um, so, scaring it off and then safely removing yourself from, from the situation um, is, is something I would suggest. Thank you. Sure, good question. Okay. Is there any other questions? Like I said, now's your chance. If you have, if you have any questions, it doesn't have to be about what we covered today. If you have questions on mountain lion, bear, anything or something like that, this is a very good resource that we May or may not get back in the future. We'll see. <laughs> but very good resource to have here right now on this question. I would like to just touch on something that was asked earlier about the doggy doors. Um, I understand folks' work schedules are, are you know, uh, very busy and you don't have time to stand out there with your dog all the time. But I would just like to harp on that. Like dog, doggy doors are only instigating potential conflict. That's just going to let give you the opportunity to let your dog outside unsupervised. And when your pet is unsupervised in an area that has a high density of coyotes, bobcats and transient li mountain lions that move throughout the area, you're just, as a property owner, you're leaving your pet very vulnerable. So I, I just wanted to touch on that because I didn't get a chance to earlier. I don't recommend doggy doors um, under any circumstance. And unfortunately with my position uh, as a human wildlife conflict biologist, I've had to um, conduct a few site visits where pets have been injured um, and almost every time it was a pet that had access to a doggy door and the owner was not outside because um, the, the, the depredating animal felt that it was a safe chance for it to opportunistically um, uh, get involved with their pet. So I just wanted to, to throw that out there on, on doggy doors. I'm not, a, I'm not a huge fan of them.
No, uh, they're, they're definitely not dangerous. But one thing to remember is, you know, if you have a small dog or a small cat that's outside, they could be perceived as potential prey from that animal. Um, but to people, no, they're just beautiful, uh, beautiful raptors that um, do a good job at keeping the, uh, you know, the, the small mammal, your, your rats and your squirrels and some of maybe the nuisance wildlife populations in check. And they, like I said, they're beautiful. <laughs> The red tail hawk, and I believe it was the Coopers. Yeah, they, they can. Um, that's another. So chickens, free roaming chickens. Um, that's another um, animal husbandry practice that I um, do not recommend. You know, having our chickens out there, you know, roaming around unsupervised to something like a hawk. Um, you know, most hawks. That's a little bit big for them. Um, some owls, uh, like your great horned owl here, which is pretty common, um, or a, a barn owl w might look at that as a, an, an opportunity. Um, but yeah, ha hawks, they can come, go after chickens. Um, we don't see it too much, but you know, every animal is subject to individualistic behavior. So um, there's no way of saying uh, no. So again, it might, it might sound like a broken record, but let's secure our, uh, our livestock and secure our property as best we can to prevent um, you know, any negative in interactions because you know, chickens are like pets as well. Uh, and we don't want to, to see any of them being lost. Good question. Yeah, there are ravens here, and um, they're um, both species are federally protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Almost all of our avian species here in California are. So um, I do get calls about uh, nuisance ravens and nuisance crows uh, on their property, and you know that's something pretty hard to manage. Um, you can put up some flagery, which is kind of like um, the same material as like the silver sp space blankets. Um, it's crinkly, it blows in the wind, it makes a noise. Um, that's been shown to be pretty effective at scaring uh, nuisance birds and like ravens and crows away. Um, so do we have ravens and crows or do we just have ravens? Ravens here, and, I'm, they're my, and crows are migratory as well. So I mean, they, in theory, they, they could come through, but yeah, there are uh, ravens up here. They're larger, um, they have a more pronounced forehead and a, a more rounded, more pronounced beak than, uh, than your crow. What do you say? What have you seen five aggressive coyotes? Four, not six, five. Five? I, I would follow the same guidance as before. You know, make yourself big and loud. And if you have a small dog or anything, pick it up. And uh, yeah, safely back away from the area um, and making sure they're not coming in. Um, and yeah, ha have something there to, to scare them. Hopefully your, your parent with you has an air horn or something. And, um, you know, if they come close, say, mom, pick me up. <laughs> um. All right, so any other questions? Okay, well, if there's no other questions, I'd like to say thank you guys for coming. This is our first one. We're hoping that uh, we can put on some more throughout the, the year to keep spreading the word so that we can hopefully have people and wildlife live together and avoid conflict. So thank you all for coming. Uh, top is just some contact information for us and the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And you all have a good night. Thank you so much.